The mysterious Beal cipher is inspired a centuries-old treasure hunt that's still ongoing kept of buried treasure is nothing new, and has continued to draw the attention of curious adventurers since time immemorial. But few legends of buried treasure have remained quite as tempting and prevalent in the social consciousness as the yet-to-be-solved Beal ciphers. Many hidden treasures are accompanied, by maps, clues, and stories. But the Beale ciphers offer something a bit more mysterious, a potentially indecipherable set of three papers, all written in a secret code, which reveal the truth of the legacy, location, and contents of Beale's treasure. Having been lost to the hills of Virginia since 1820, the treasure is believed to be valued at nearly $54 million in today's U.S. dollars, and, contains a luxurious combination of gold, silver, and precious gems. Of the three cipher texts Beale allegedly left behind, later printed into a collection known as the Beale Papers, only one of them has ever been solved, leaving the final two to tempt treasure hunters for centuries afterward in hopes of being lucky enough to discover its long-lost location. In January 1820, a mysterious man, named Thomas J. Beeler Ived in Lynchburg, Virginia little has ever been learned about Thomas J. Beale, where he came from where he inevitably went, or whether he ever truly existed at all. But his alleged narrative begins in Lynchburg, VA, in January 1820, when he arrived in the small town, unknown by and unaffiliated with anyone there. As soon as he arrived in Lynchburg, he set up residence at the popular Washington Hotel and stayed there through the remainder of the winter. He maintained a rather mysterious disposition toward those he interacted with, revealing little to nothing about his past or future plans. Robert Morris, the owner of the hotel, recalled Beale's alleged arrival colon dot 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 Thomas J. Beale, as he appeared in 1820. Registered simply from Virginia, but I am of the, impression he was from some western portion of the state. Curiously enough, he never adverted to his family or to his antecedents, nor did I question him concerning them as I would have done had I dreamed of the interest that in the future would attach to his name. Beale was very popular in Lynchburg, but he suddenly disappeared after two months Beale's arrival, along with two unnamed, friends who allegedly left a few days after their original arrival, left a mark on Lynchburg's residents, as he was said to be a rather striking man about six feet in height, with jet black eyes and hair of the same color, worn longer than was the style at that time and memorably polite and charismatic. He was described as being a model of manly beauty, favored by the ladies and envied by, men with his distinguishing feature, being, a dark and swarthy complexion, as if much exposure to the sun and weather had thoroughly tanned and discolored him. His particularly polite disposition led to his becoming well known throughout Lynchburg, so his sudden disappearance at the end of March 1820, without explanation or any apparent plans to return, left people puzzled. No one in Lynchburg, heard from him again for two years. Two years later, Beale returned to entrust a locked iron box to hotel owner Robert Morris nearly two years after Beale suddenly disappeared, he returned just as mysteriously, to the likely surprise of the townspeople. After resuming his residence at the Washington Hotel, Beale had an additional request to make of Robert Morris the hotel's owner, regarding the protection of a locked box made of iron, allegedly containing a collection of extremely valuable papers. Beale gave Morris the sealed box to watch over, with very specific instructions to hold on to the box until he, or one of his friends, returned to retrieve it. If he did not hear from Beale after ten years, Morris was to open the box and follow the instructions left inside. Beale, never returned. When Morris opened the box 23 years later, he found strange ciphers in a note from Beale even though Morris was instructed by Beale to open the sealed box once a decade had passed, Morris waited nearly 23 years to follow through with his promise. Some speculate that this was because Morris still hoped Beale was alive and would return to claim his papers. In the box, Morris found three papers covered in inexplicable numbers, and a note. The note revealed the truth about the contents of the box, and the reason for Beale's secrecy around it. 
The node Morris found inside the box explained the origins of an unknown treasure before Thomas Beale first arrived in Lynchburg in 1820. He and a group of 30 other men made a journey west from Virginia to an area, outside of Santa Fe, NM, with the intent to earn money by hunting wild game. When they were getting ready to head farther north, one of the men came across what appeared to be gold in a ravine nearby. Further investigation, with the help of the rest of the group, concluded that not only was it one bit of gold, but a piece of an entire mine's worth. The men excavated the area for the next 18 months, and then decided it would be safest to relocate the gold they'd already collected back east in Virginia, where they were all from. It is possible that it was during Beale's first stay in Lynchburg that he hid the first half of the treasure, with his return two years later, he presumably stashed the remainder. It is believed that the entire stash of treasure contains 2,921 pounds of gold, 5,100 pounds of silver, and $1.5 million in precious stones valued at nearly $54 million today. Morris was then left with the box containing the truth about the stash's whereabouts. Beale's note said he buried a fortune somewhere in Lynchburg in addition to explaining the origins of the treasure that Beale and his team had discovered. The note Morris found within the sealed box also, explained that this very same treasure was, in its entirety, hidden somewhere nearby Lynchburg. The problem was, the note didn't specify where exactly this was, only that Morris had to solve the ciphers contained within the box to uncover the details of the treasure's location. Morris set to work attempting to decipher the three number strewn letters, but to no avail. After decades of painstaking work, Morris had gotten no closer to learning the truth about the treasure. Decades later, Morris shared his secret with a friend, who published a pamphlet about Beale's ciphers worried that he would never successfully solve the ciphers left in his possession and fulfill the promise he had made to the long-disappeared Thomas Beale. Morris sought the assistance of a close friend, in deciphering the clues hidden within the pages of numbers. In 1885, James B. Ward agreed to take on the challenge alongside his friend, and together they continued their attempts at solving the cipher. Morris passed some time after sharing the puzzle, leaving the burden of the ciphers to rest entirely on Ward's shoulders. It was around this time that Ward finally stumbled upon a solution to one, of the three ciphers. Even with the help of the first cipher, Ward was unable to solve the other two, as a result. He decided to publish his findings, as well as the details of the remaining two ciphers. He sold this pamphlet to would-be treasure hunters, inviting them to help discover the whereabouts of the long-lost treasure. The key to solving the second cipher was the declaration of independence after Morris handed off the unsolved ciphers to James B. Ward, they set to work on solving it together. But it was only after Morris's passing that Ward finally discovered the unlikely clue to solving at least one of the ciphers, the Declaration of Independence. After a series of unrecorded events, Ward thought to compare the numbers found on the second of the three ciphers, the one believed to describe the exact contents of the treasure, to their corresponding word in the Declaration. He then used the first letter of that word to represent the cipher number. The resulting transcription of the nearly 800 numbers into letters allegedly resulted in the following transcribed solution, I have deposited in the county of Bedford, about 4 miles from Bufords, in an excavation or vault, 6 feet below the surface of the ground, the following articles, belonging jointly to the parties whose names are given in number 3, herewith, the first deposit consisted of 1,014 pounds of gold and 3,812 pounds of silver, deposited November 1819. The second was made December 1821, and consisted of 1,907 pounds of gold, and 1,288 pounds of silver, also jewels, obtained in St. Louis in exchange for silver to save transportation, and valued at $13,000. The above is securely packed in iron pots, with iron covers. The vault is roughly lined with stone, and the vessels rest on solid stone, and are covered with others. Paper number 1 describes the exact locality of the vault so that no difficulty will be had in finding it. Throughout the 20th century, 
Many people tried to decode the other ciphers, but all failed after the publication and distribution of the Beale Papers by James B. Ward in 1885. The allure of the allegedly hidden treasure spread far and wide, leading an unfathomable number of people, code breakers, cryptanalysts, and treasure hunters alike, to attempt to solve the remaining two ciphers and seize the hidden fortune for themselves. When the puzzle surrounding the ciphers proved to be too mind-numbingly difficult, some traded in their pencils for shovels and took to the countryside around Lynchburg in search of the six feet of dirt that promised to reveal the treasure. To this day, each and every person who has sought the treasure, either on paper or in the field has failed, leading many to wonder whether it, really exists at all. The treasure remains unfound. The author of the pamphlets warned would-be codebreakers not to let the ciphers consume them upon publishing the ciphers in a pamphlet for the public to help decipher, Ward included a word of caution to would-be treasure hunters and puzzle solvers. He warned of the ease with which the ciphers could take over one's every waking thought, and, the importance of designating a line between working on the puzzle and living daily life. He worried that people would, upon being exposed to the cipher, become consumed by it, just as he and Morris had. His warning read, before giving the papers to the public, I would give them a little advice, acquired by bitter experience. It is, to devote only such time as can be spared from your legitimate, business to the task, and if you can spare